Hello everyone and welcome to NSTA Web Seminars where you can find live interactive learning at your desktop. Today's seminar is titled, How Do I Develop a Story Storyline for a Unit? Our presenters are Brian Reiser and Michael Novak. My name is Ruth Hudson and I will be moderating today's program. This web seminar is one of a series of web seminars around three-dimensional teaching and learning. And if you have been unable to see the past three web seminars, do not worry. You can watch all of these seminar series in archive. All you have to do is go to the Learning Center and enter the date of the seminar in the search box, and then you'll be able to view those web seminars in the archive. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Dr. Brian Reiser is with Northwestern University. Michael Novak is also with Parkview School and Northwestern University. And I'd like to turn the program over to Brian. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. It's great to be here. Um, our focus in this webinar is how to bring three-dimensional learning the target of NGSS and the framework for K-12 science into the classroom. Now, a lot of us in trying to think about three-dimensional learning think about, okay, so we have to combine all three of these dimensions. But what does that really look like? And our focus in this webinar is what it really means to organize lessons around these three dimensions where science and engineering practices play a key role. There's a reason that the framework uses the term practices. These are not just science process skills. We don't just mean learning how to engage in uh, designing experiments for experiment's sake. Calling it a practice means that kids are involved in a coherent system of building and using knowledge. It's guided by common norms, ways of doing things, and ways of talking about them. So, if we're really involving students in a social practice, that means that they need to be partners with teachers. They have to participate in the developing and managing of plans for investigations. So if kids are analyzing data or constructing a model because that's what the worksheet says to do, then they're not engaging in a practice. So we're going to talk about what it means to try and support coherence from the student's perspective where students are partners with teachers in managing the trajectory of the knowledge building. So we'll take a look at how we can develop uh, a classroom in which students' questions are what are motivating the work that we're doing, where every step we do is an attempt to address a question or maybe a gap in the progress that we've made so far. And we're engaging in the practices is not because the teacher says, today we're going to do practice number three, but because the class figures out that we need to make progress on a question that we are trying to figure out or some problem that we're trying to solve. So let's start off with an example um, to kind of bring that contrast to light. So here's a typical example that, uh, of, a, of an investigation that might take place in an elementary classroom. Um, how many of us have uh, seen an elementary classroom or taught in an elementary classroom where we do an experiment where kids are, are playing around with whether plants need light to grow. So we say, this is really cool. Um, what we're going to do is you're going to get to uh, design an experiment and pick some conditions to see whether plants need light or not. So like, what do you think we should try? And we talk with the kids and we'll come up with the idea of let's put one plant near the windowsill so it's getting plenty of light and we'll put another plant in the uh, Maybe we'll put it in the closet or we'll cover it up with something. So is that involving the practice of planning and conducting investigations? Um, we might be able to get to this important disciplinary core idea of what plants need to grow, and we'll probably be able to get to some cross-cutting ideas about structure and function and cause and effect. So is that a three-dimensional lesson? Does this really reflect what we're trying to get to? And our argument is that this is only a piece of the puzzle. We need to think about, from the student's perspective, what are you guys working on? Why are you doing this? And if the reason the kids are comparing plants in the light to plants in the dark because the teacher said, hey, that's our goal for today, 
you guys will get to play around and design this thing, but I'm giving you the question and it's coming out of nowhere, then our argument is we haven't really achieved the vision of the framework in NGSS. This should be a question that kids understand why we're asking this question. And kids have some role in figuring out how we're going to make progress on it. So let's take a second example. Um, haven't you ever wondered what's inside of a seed that allows plants to grow? Look, we're going to do this cool thing. We'll cut it open and we'll check out what's inside of it. It'll be fun. So that's cool. But again, we want to ask the question, wait, why are we wondering what's inside a seed? Why are we cutting it open? Where did this idea come from? So our argument is that we need to do more to make a three-dimensional lesson than just bring together the three dimensions. We really need to work with kids on developing the questions that motivate the science practices. So we want to be thinking about classrooms where kids are partners in the knowledge building. And these are classrooms where kids can say, we figure out the science ideas, working with the teacher to do that. We figure out where we're going at each step. We put the pieces of the science ideas together over time. And if we can achieve this in a classroom, this is what we call a storyline, a coherent storyline, where the teacher is helping the kids identify questions to work on, put together pieces of the puzzle over time, and they are involved and understand why are we working on this? How is, this, how is the thing we're going to do today going to help us? Our argument is you should be able to walk over to a table of kids and say, hey, what are you working on? And whether they're in kindergarten or whether they're jaded high school students, they should be able to tell you how what they're working on is going to help them make progress on a question, and they should tell you why that question matters. So in order to make progress on organizing, adapting units, to, to develop this sort of classroom where the kids are partners in figuring out we suggest there are sort of five questions that are productive to think about. And we're going to take you through uh, a quick overview of these five questions and ways to think about them during this webinar. And the first one we're going to work on is how do we kick off investigations? How do we get started? Then we'll look at how do we work with students to motivate the next step that we should be working on? And how do we use practices to figure out pieces of ideas and make progress? Then we'll look at how we can push students to go deeper. When they think they've got the whole story, how do we push them to go even deeper? And finally, how do we help them to put the pieces together across a series of lessons? So to do this, we're going to start with our first example. And I should point out that all the examples we're going to look at tonight are um, downloadable uh, from, a, from some links we'll give you at the end. So the uh, lesson plans and examples of student work and all of that are uh, downloadable, uh, and you can take a look at them at your leisure. So let's, let's take a look at um, a second grade classroom. And this is um, a unit that was put together by a group of teachers working with us in, in Connecticut. Um, and it, 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 we call this the, uh, the harvest corn unit. And it starts off by the teacher talking about um, the, some decorations she's going to do uh, in the classroom um, before Halloween and before Thanksgiving. She's going to bring in some harvest corn to decorate the classroom. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, something has happened. Uh, she left this box of harvest corn, this cardboard box. Um, she had forgotten about it and left it outside her garage, and it got rained on. Um, and so the kids are all wondering what will happen. And the teacher is really trying to uh, uh, cultivate that sense of, of, of questions and, and, and predictions about what will happen next. And what the kids decide is, you know, they're not really sure. Some kids are thinking that all the colors will run out of the corn if it gets wet. Um, uh, that some kids are thinking it's going to rot. Uh, some kids are thinking that, um, you know, I don't know, if it got wet, maybe it might actually grow. Um, so they're not entirely sure. And one of the kids, one of the things that comes up as an idea is, hey, can we see this a little bit closer? Can we just, like, take a look at 
this corn. Um, in fact, if you have any that didn't get wet, let's take a look at that and see uh, what we can figure out about it. And that's what the teacher decides to do um, with the kids. And so what we um, have for you at a couple of key points is a quick video that you can look at. Um, if you have trouble getting the videos to work, I'm going to talk through um, some of the things that the kids say, although I won't be as uh, cute as the kids are when they have their ideas. Um, but uh, if you can, uh, um, I think Ruth is going to put the URL into the chat window there, and you can click on it, or you can type it yourself into a browser. And it's just a very quick 26-second video, and just it's subtitled, so you can hear a little bit about what the kids are saying when they do their first sort of investigation of just taking a look at this harvest part. So we're going to pause uh, and let you guys go take a look at it. Thank you, Brian. I've gone ahead and put the video link in the chat. And I'm going to set a timer for about 30 seconds and allow you guys to watch the video. And then we'll come back when the timer goes off. Uh, and we should point out there's a, there's a password needed. And the password is also in the chat window there. Uh, NSTA in CAPS webinar. All right, so I'm going to turn the program back over to Brian, and he's going to talk a little bit about the video. Brian, it's all yours. OK, so I hope some of you can get to it. Um, if not, basically, um, what the kids are doing is taking a look at it. And one of the things that, I mean, I hope all of you are familiar with this kind of corn. Um, one of the things that the kids are noticing is um, you know, it's kind of hard, and it looks like plastic. And the girl that you can see on the slide says, wait, is this fake? And the teacher says, good question. Uh, um, the student says, I think it is. And, and then she notices another girl's uh, sample of corn. Hey, hers is all brown. Um, so the kids are, uh, and this is a very common reaction, uh, the kids are kind of skeptical that this is actually real. Um, maybe it's plastic. Maybe it's something else. So um, this generates a lot of questions. And the, the next slide here um, shows from two different classrooms. Um, they kind of did it in two different ways. Uh, one classroom has a set of predictions on the left. Um, the other classroom has some wondering that they recorded. Um, and they're asking, they're, they're predicting and asking questions like, well, I think it'll get ruined. Maybe it'll rot. Um, one student says, and each of these is a different student's idea. Uh, student K said, I think it might grow because it has water. Uh, it'll get like a bigger piece of coin. It'll just get fatter. Another says it'll get darker because it's going to die. Or it'll stain because it's a decoration. Some, one student thinks it might, get rot, it might rot and get sticky. In the other classroom, they have, um, they're wondering about the leaves that are on the corn. I wonder, I wonder if those leaves are made of seaweed. Uh, I wonder if we put the pieces in water if they will grow. I wonder if it's real, et cetera. Maybe the colors will go away and it will turn yellow like normal corn. So lots of interesting questions. Um, and in talking through these questions, the teacher um, helps the students converge on, so what should we do next? So now what? And um, we've transcribed here. The teacher has written up the, what the kids came up with, and we've transcribed it below on the slide. Well, we could observe it every day and see, did the colors change? We could draw a sciagram, which in this classroom uh, is how they refer to a science diagram, to show what's happening. And, and they also decide, you know what, we should use models at every, to show every stage. So we, should, we can teach people what happened when, once they figure out what happens. So now they've come up with some questions, some wonderings. And some ideas about how to resolve some of those questions. And what we want to suggest here is that these are four important elements of cultivating a phenomenon-based investigation with kids. This is 
these four things, maybe not in this order all the time, but these are four important things that we want to, we want to do. We have to engage kids with a phenomenon and see what they notice, maybe they play around with it. Um, we need to give them an opportunity and start asking them to try and explain it and to talk about it and see if their, invest, if their explanations are agreeing. We need to allow them to connect with things they already know. Like I know that um, if it's plastic, then you know uh, it should be hard, and, and if it's a real plant, it should be soft to the touch or whatever from their everyday life they, they need to bring in. And we need to give them a chance to try and think about well, what can we do to figure out, to make progress on our questions. And so we think of this as a kind of a routine or a, a set of elements that whether it's kindergarten students or older kids, we want to involve them in, in these four elements. Again, maybe in a different order or maybe uh, combining in different ways, but um, we need to figure out what we think is happening and notice what's happening in the phenomenon, try and make sense of it, see where we agree or disagree, connect to other things that we know about, and then develop some questions. So what we want to do now is I'm going to turn the mic over to Michael, who will talk about some other examples of um, units where we try and do this. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Michael Novak here. So yeah, let's, let's take a look at another unit and see if we can identify some of these elements that Brian suggested are really productive for kicking off a storyline. So let's look at another context. The second storyline that we're going to look at uh, is in grade five, and it targets performance expectations related to the cycling of matter, flow of energy through ecosystems and organisms, and it was developed by a team of teachers in Connecticut and in Illinois. And it kicks off with a phenomena that leads students to wonder, why do dead things seem to disappear over time? So we start out with a teacher bringing in a photograph of something they noticed alongside the road. The teacher noticed that there was this body of this animal that had died. And when students look at the photograph that the teacher brings in, they notice something about it. They'd say, I mean, actually, I actually think that's a raccoon. And actually thinking about what this animal is leads them to recall some other experiences they've had with similar phenomena. Not everyone's seen a raccoon. The kids at this age have a wealth of experiences stumbling on dead stuff at some point in their life. And that includes common things like worms and birds and fish. You can see some of their examples over there on the side to the right. So now that we have some ideas out there about other things we've come across in the world, the next logical thing that kids start talking about is like, well, what would happen to this thing if we came back to this spot and looked like two weeks later? Would it still be there? Would we see anything different? What do we predict would happen to the body of this dead animal? Because kids have a wealth of experiences coming across something like this, be it a bird or a fish, their predictions are largely in agreement. They say things like, I don't know, something's going to eat it, you find holes in it, my insects will be on it. Maybe one student brings up, you know, maybe, maybe bacteria would eat it, whatever that is. So we've got some interesting ideas about what would happen, and we kind of want to check this out now. Because, like, the more we think about it, none of us have ever really, like, sat and watched what would happen. But that seems a little unrealistic, and the class suggests we can't really go out from the classroom for two weeks in a row and just sit there and watch a dead animal. We're going to need another way to investigate this. Maybe... As you can see, the student, the photograph to the right says, maybe we could, like, take pictures or something or get a video. Well, this is actually what the teacher has anticipated they're going to say. Some of what she's done in the anchoring phenom with the anchoring phenomena and this routine has led students to say, we're going to need this data. We're going to need a video. We're going to need some photographs of some kind of animal on the ground that's dead for a couple of weeks in order to find out if we're on the right track or not. And the teacher so shows them the data they need the next day. Shows them a video, time lapse of two weeks of a dead animal, shows them some photographs to analyze, and they start explaining what they observed. 
and what they can't see happening. Because by the time it hits day 14, the animal looks very different than it did at first. And here we start to see students as they share out their explanations, they start to diverge a little bit in what they think is happening in between one photo and the next. Some kids say, well, the reason it's changing is because it's getting eaten up piece by piece. Some kids say, like, we see little things crawling over it, like insects. Some even call them, like, maggots. Others aren't really sure what that is. Some say, like, well, something's causing it to dissolve. And uh, other students are saying, well, really what's just happening is just getting sucked into the earth. So they're starting to share out these alternate explanations. Like, like, now there's, like, even more that we're wondering about. What exactly is causing the thing to, like, disappear? Is it really disappearing or is it, like, going somewhere? So we could end there, but the class goes a step further. As we're thinking about animals that fall to the ground and and die and what happens to them, it, it raises another natural question. Do other things that were once alive disappear like this after they die and fall to the ground? Will they brainstorm other living things that fall to the ground after they were once alive besides animals? And the first thing kids bring up is plants, trees, flowers. And once they shift to start thinking about that, there's even more disagreement about like, would we get the same outcome as we do for an animal, would the same mechanisms be at work on plants that are on animals? So now we've got even more disagreement. And the teacher kind of pauses us at this point and says, sounds like we got so many questions. We should totally jot these down, what it is we're wondering about, and build a mission board, build a driving question board so we can, we can decide how we're going to answer our questions and keep track of all the questions we need to answer. So they go public with those questions, keep that in the room as a space that's going to like guide the work of their class for weeks to come. But that's not where they quite end their first lesson. They do one more step. If we look at the questions they've come up with, they're not all pointing in the same direction. Like some of the questions are like leading us to think about what's going on to the body of the animal that we can't see. We can see stuff from the outside, but that just raises questions like what's going on in the inside? Like the animals insides, are there maggots on the inside to start with? Are there insects coming from the inside or the outside? Like it's not all obvious just from the video. So we could pursue that line of questions, right? But that's not all of our questions. Some of the kids' questions go in a different direction. They're like, wait, something doesn't make sense in the video. There's fur and bones still there. That can't be all there is to this because right from our everyday experience, we go outside and you don't find bones and fur everywhere. But things do die. So, like, we got to figure that out, too. And then we have this shift the kids are starting to make, too, to think about, wait, now that I think about plants, which is pretty common, like, what's up with them? Do they get, like, eaten up the way it looked like maybe the animal did? And, like, does it matter they're on soil? And then I think about it, like, what is eating it up? I think I've seen things, like, growing on plants, and I'm not sure, was it the plant, the mushroom, the wood? I, I got some questions now about dead plants. And we got this fourth category. And that is, like, wait, now you got me thinking about plants and their interactions with the world around them. Now I feel like there's some kind of connection between plants and what they need to grow and, and death and soil and you know what, I actually am not really sure like what even plants need to grow because I feel like sometimes dead things fall to the ground and new things sprout up where they were. Okay, we've got four areas of questions, four different directions to go. What are we going to do to answer these questions? And the class decides that in order to answer these questions, they've got to come up with some ideas for investigations. Just like in corn, we've got to figure out how it is we're going to answer these questions in our classroom. And Notice that the four types of investigations they come up with largely target the four areas of their questions. Let's see what happens to these bones and fur. We've got to check out what's going on on the inside of the organism. And we've got to do some stuff with plants. Maybe it matters whether it's on soil. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe we should try some different experiments to see. Maybe it matters whether it's outside or not. Maybe we should bring some inside and watch them closely over time. So, the class now is at a point where they're really done with the launch of their unit. And what do they have? They've got some questions. They've got some ideas for investigations. And they have a direction 
that they're going to pursue in the weeks to come. We'd argue that that's very similar to what we've seen in corn. In the second grade corn example, we saw the kids ending the start of their work in the classroom with next steps and next questions that they want to investigate. Let's look at a third example to see if we can see those same elements of this routine at work, but in this case, in high school. So uh, the storyline we're going to take a look at here was uh, developed around topics in the area of evolution, built by teams of teachers from many states, uh, and targeting high school. So in this case, we start out with an anchoring phenomena that really gets the kids wondering, wait, why aren't antibiotics seeming to work like they used to? And the anchoring phenomena we introduce is the case of Eddie. Uh, Eddie's a little girl that we are in introduced to through a, um, a video clip the teacher brings in from a frontline PBS episode. Describes her case where she came in and to the hospital and was diagnosed with a bacteria infection but gets progressively sicker and sicker in spite of giving her different doses of different kinds of antibiotics. Until at one point the doctors realize that they're kind of in a bad situation because this poor little girl is now in a life-threatening state because she has pan-resistant bacteria, which the students learn means there's no antibiotics that can kill it. The case ends there at a very emotional point with a sort of cliffhanger. Will this girl survive? Well, this leads students to want to dig into this case more and try to figure out what were all the events that happened that led up to her condition, because maybe they'll give clues about why this happened to her, how it happened to her, because the video never explains why or how this happens. It simply provides a set of facts for kids to like dig into and try to make sense of. So the students build a timeline, which raises more questions, and some of those we'll see on the next page. But before we form questions, it makes sense to do one other thing. This, is this just Eddie? Is she the only person who goes in and takes antibiotics and they stop working? So we brainstorm all the experiences we've had with going to the doctor and getting a prescription for antibiotics, and did the medicine work? We find that sometimes it does, in some of our cases, we think, actually, it didn't seem to help. And that led to a slew of questions. And some of the questions that we started to raise as a class were about, well, Eddie's case in particular. But some were more about, like, how common is this, like, general type of phenomena? Is this, like, a thing that I have to worry about for myself or my family or other people in the world? And now that I'm thinking about it, I actually don't know much about diseases or bacteria. We got questions about how are those contracted? How are those transmitted? Or for that matter, how do antibiotics even work? What even kills bacteria? So again, we've got like these different directions to head as a class. We have different places we could go. But what we also have is a mission board to guide the work of our class for weeks to come. And if we answer these questions, by the end of the unit, we'll actually end up figuring out some important science ideas. Answering these questions helps lead kids to developing a model for natural selection. So this marks our third case we've looked at, where we kind of introduce these ideas of certain elements are very productive to kick off an NGSS design unit. And one of those elements we want to think about are this idea of exploring and anchoring phenomena and trying to make sense of it, even before we know how it works. So we'd like to take a, our first poll of two here in the next two slides, uh, and that polls around these four possible answers related to the question, in the classroom materials that you have to work with, how often do they provide support for beginning the unit by having students explore an anchoring phenomena first? Uh, let's take a, a moment to respond to that poll, and uh, we'll see what our distribution of responses are. Thank you, Michael. Um, I've gone ahead and enabled the poll, and I see a lot of people voting right now. We have over 250 participants. So if you could uh, respond to this poll by either answering A, every unit I use anchoring phenomenon, B, most units, C, some units, 
or D, rarely or never. And we'll just wait a couple more uh, seconds to allow pe people to respond because, like I said, we have over 250 people responding to this. Um, while we're waiting, um, uh, what I'll do is um, momentarily I'll lock the responses and then I'll publish those responses uh, to the slide for, um, for Michael and then I'll turn it back over to him. So you've got about 10 more seconds to respond to this and then I'm going to lock the responses. So vote early, vote often. It looks like some people are typing in the chat instead of... They are, they are, that's true. All right, I'm going to go ahead and lock the responses. So responses are now locked, and I'm publishing those responses to the whiteboard, and I'll move them up so and kind of adjust so that you can see them a little better. I'll turn it back over to you. Cool. So we can see uh, some interesting patterns in the distribution, right? A lot of the materials that I feel like I've had access to as a teacher and many of you have had access to don't necessarily support students in starting out with exploring and anchoring phenomena first. But we know from NGSS design criteria that everything that's three-dimensional needs to be in service of trying to explain phenomena or design solutions to it. So one of the ways that we approach analyzing and developing or tweaking our instructional materials to make them more three-dimensional is to use this routine where we start out with an anchoring phenomena and try to make sense of it uh, in order to launch a unit. So work going forward for our community, our whole science community is still, we feel in this area, an important step in the direction of trying to start with anchoring phenomena first and, um, and then leverage it. Let's move to a second poll. Oh, but maybe before I do, Brian, did you want to say more about the distribution of responses there? Anything else you'd like to add? No, let's go into the second. Okay. So the second poll we want to think about is um, related to another question for the same routine. Many materials that do have anchoring phenomena or design problems to start the work of the class uh, may, or may not necessarily do the second part, which is help students develop questions and ideas for investigations for the class to pursue based on their experiences with anchoring phenomena based on the questions and the wonderings that they raise through their work with it. So let's take stock of our own experiences with the materials that we have to work with. Often do they provide support embedded in them to help students do that, develop questions and ideas for investigations for the class to pursue over future lessons. All right, thank you, Michael. So please continue to vote. Those of you that already started, thank you very much. Um, if you have um, resources for every unit, vote A, uh, B for most units, C for some units, or D, rarely or never, do you find classroom materials that help uh, develop, help students develop questions or ideas for investigations? Again, we've got 200 people. Um, approaching 300, so please keep voting and um, I'll give you uh, a couple more seconds to go to vote. I may have a uh, quick question. I may have uh, made the slides disappear. I, I saw somebody say that it looks like it, uh, it's no longer appearing, so maybe. No, your slides are still there. Okay. Cool. All right, I'll give you 10 more seconds. I'm going to go ahead and lock the responses. The responses are now locked. I'm going to publish those responses to the whiteboard. And it looks like more people voted this time. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to you, Michael. Great. Uh, I see a couple of people still saying that the slides uh, may be a problem for them in the chat window. But I will uh, talk a little bit about the responses we see here. So uh, again, it looks like a few of the materials we, we have out there in the field really support this in every unit. But it does look like we have some that do it. Um, but uh, some of us may find that the materials we're working with, 35% of us feel like the units that we have 
rarely or never support students in this. Uh, we feel it's, this is tricky to do, to really help students frame questions and ideas for investigations, particularly in a way that's going to help lead the class to uncovering the key disciplinary core ideas and developing mastery around the target performance expectations. Because that suggests that like, not every question is going to be productive and not every idea for investigation will, will um, help us generate clues and uh, key ideas that are going to help build the work of the class towards those targets. So uh, we think this is a, a good point for us to maybe stop uh, for a couple minutes and talk through some questions from the audience, take, take a couple of those. Related to the first question we've tried to answer, uh, how do we kick off investigations in the event? We have four other questions that we'll dig into over the rest of um, the presentation. Uh, but for now, let's uh, take a few questions related to question one. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Julie had a question early on that wanted to know, what does the exploring anchoring, anchoring phenomenon look like in kindergarten? So that's a really good question. Um, and uh, a second part of that question also is it depends on what the phenomena is, uh, and it depends in, on what aspects of it we want to dwell on and the question that we want kids to attend to. So messing around with stuff and interacting with it in many ways before we're really satisfied that we have a good sense of what the phenomena is. Uh, is one key part of the routine for younger kids. We feel that dwelling long enough on the phenomena so that we can appreciate all of its complexity is something that is sometimes underutilized uh, in traditional instructional approaches. We look at something briefly and move on. It doesn't give us necessarily enough time to really get a sense of how the thing works or what's interesting about it or some of the nuances related to it. So. Um, our example we gave here is related to second grade, but we do have a storyline example related to first grade as one of the links at the end of um, our presentation. And uh, I'll say a little bit about that uh, because I feel the first grade one is really close to maybe the age group of kindergartners, and maybe we can take some design principles out of that. Um, that phenomena that we start that unit with, which is um, can I see anything in the dark? What can I see in the dark? And how can we make our room dark as possible uh, is built out of a relatively simple phenomenon. We ask kids to take stock of the number of shapes they can count and see on a piece of paper. But we ask them to do that at various locations around the classroom with the lights turned off. And when kids take the count of those numbers and then report them out, one surprising finding is not everyone agrees on the number of shapes they can see on a piece of paper uh, at various locations in the room, which then raises the question, wait, how many shapes are there actually on the paper? Which the kids then suggest, well, we should turn the lights on to check that out, which leads to an even more surprising finding, which is none of us were right. There are more shapes on the paper than any of us could see, and that is enough to get the class starting thinking about other experiences they've had where they cannot see things very well in the dark, and whether you even need light in order to see things in the dark, as well as how we could test that, which brings the question up. How could we make our room here as dark as possible in order to answer some of our questions? Thank you, Michael. Uh, John has a question. What do you do if the students generate more researchable questions instead of investigatable ones? You mean if their questions are like, I'm taking that to mean like you can look it up on Google. I think that's what he's asking. That's a really good question. Uh, one of the things we try to do in thinking of a good anchoring phenomena uh, and a good use of the anchoring phenomena routine is to milk the space of related phenomena and how and why questions enough that we get kids to raise questions that are really hard to just Google. Um, 
that's a good point he brings up, though. Like, what if a kid uh, raises a question, like, you can just look up the answer to it on Google. I mean, a lot of those might be, what's the name of this thing, or where do I find something like this in the world? But in general, how or why questions are really hard to find uh, answers to on, on Google. And we find that when we use this routine, the majority of questions that kids come up with are how and why questions. Yeah, and let me just add to that really quickly. I think that what we see teachers doing is working a lot with kids to build a culture where we're really trying to learn how to develop questions that allow us to make progress. Questions that, um, as Michael said, get into the how and the why rather than um, just like what is the name of this thing or is this, you know, we could maybe Google and find out if the harvest corn is real or not. But how do we know? Like why should we believe somebody else's answer? What would count as good evidence? And I think um, as we go further in the cases that we're going to look at uh, this evening, you'll see ways that the teachers try and not only help kids come up with a question that is sort of arising naturally, but sort of prod the kids a little bit and cultivate disagreements that are really helpful in surfacing questions, things that we might not have realized we didn't understand until the teacher actually pushed on it. So we'll, we'll see that coming up soon. Great. Thank you, Brian. There's one more um, that actually is going to mirror several questions that people have been asking. It's from Kathleen. I'll read you her comment and her question. Phenomenon are sometimes clear and concrete in bio, often in physics, but in chem, it is a little tough than other reactions. What about abstract concepts like atomic models or microscopic models? Is there Sorry, I have to scroll down. Is there a resource for these phenomena by topic instead of racking our brains? I'll turn it over to you guys. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and uh, I think maybe we can return to this at the end, but I'll just give a quick response right now. I mean, sometimes the questions that we're going to help the kids generate come out of gaps in the model that we're trying to build. So our argument is, yes, for anchoring phenomena, we need to start with something that motivates digging into a scientific explanation. Um, and the big ideas in NGSS all do that. Maybe we want to get into um, understanding something about um, what it is, what are, what's keeping the pieces of a molecule together, or what's keeping um, uh, in a salt, what's keeping the positive and the negative ions attached to each other. Eventually, we're going to have to figure out something about the structure of that molecule and what's keeping it together. But what are the phenomena in the real world that motivate looking at how pieces of things work together and what happens when they break apart? And so, in fact, that's how we're going to start the unit. How come when you mix certain things, they get hotter. When you mix other things, they get colder. Wait, this is like really weird. How does that work? That's where we're going to start. Eventually, we'll get into what is it that happens when things break apart and reattach. And we'll get into that molecular level. But we're going to start with the macro level to motivate the investigations. All right, thank you, Brian. I think we probably at this point should move on. There's some other questions yes. in the chat. And if you haven't gotten your question answered, don't worry. Um, we will get to them because we will have another time within this web seminar to answer those. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to Michael, and he can go on to the next part. Thank you. So let's pick back up with the corn example that Brian started us out with in order to answer the other questions that we want to explore in the webinar. So to answer our next two questions, how do we work with students to motivate the next step in an investigation? And how do we help students use practices to figure out pieces of the science ideas? Let's pick up where we left off. And remember from anchoring phenomena that uh, in this class, one of the questions that was raised in the video was, wait, is this is this real corn or is it fake? And part of the argument that the class develops is, well, if it's real, then like real corn, it's going to have parts to it, certain parts. 
like this thing that helps it stay together, and then maybe these things that break off, like seeds. But if it's fake, then it would be different, right? It would be plastic or empty. There'd be no parts, probably no seeds. So we have a question going in that we've motivated from the anchoring phenomena, and this leads to a natural investigation. And to see what this investigation is, this taking apart of the corn, we have a short video clip, uh, a little under a minute, and it, again, a tiny URL for that to get to it, and the same password as before, uh, NSTA, all caps, and then lowercase webinar. That's all one word, NSTA webinar, and it's in the chat window. Uh, we'd like you to take a peek at it if you can, and in the next, uh, in about a minute, we'll pick up on the next slide uh, describing some of what we heard the kids talk about and say in the video. All right, thank you, Michael. I've placed the link into the chat, and I'm going to set the timer for one minute, and once the timer goes off, we'll have you all come back and, um, and join us. So there's the timer, and for those that didn't see that URL, there it is. We'll see you in a minute. All right, if we could come back to um, the Blackboard Collaborate, uh, Michael's going to explain the video and talk to us about the uh, next steps. Michael? Great, thank you. Uh, so you part of what you would have seen the video, and you can see here if you didn't get a chance to, to view it, is um, as the kids are taking apart the corn in short order, they start to see evidence and patterns in the dissection of the cord that leads them to make some claims. So one of the kids says, okay, this is real, because look, it's got this structure, this hair. And another kid says, look, it, it's real, it's, it's white, that stuff underneath it, you know, that thing in the middle, whatever it's called, that cob or whatever. And the teacher points out, well, you guys said it, it's real if it had this thing to hold it together, whatever this is. And because well, it does, right? It's got a stem that goes inside of it. So, like, we've answered our question. This is real corn. We're done. But then another student says, wait, now I'm wondering, how do they change these type of colors? Because if it's real corn, something's not right, right? Real corn's not like this. It's not like purple. And the teacher makes a move to say, hey, what, what seeds, do, what, sorry, what parts do we see? And the kids point out some of the parts and say, well, seeds, kernels. And instead of saying whether seeds are kernels, the teacher says, wait, are kernels seeds? Which then leads to another question and an idea for an investigation. Wait, if kernels are seeds, then we should plant them and see if they grow. And this is raised by another student. So we'd like to point out that part of what's happening in, in any investigation isn't just trying to answer our question. It isn't just to try to figure out claims that we can make about what we were wondering about. That is part of it. But once we do that, the next logical step is to identify the gaps in our understanding and the new questions we have that lead to next steps and new ideas for future investigations we should pursue. So how does a teacher help work with students' ideas to motivate the next step in the investigation? Here's an example of it. Let's draw their attention to gaps in our understanding now based on what we have figured out at this point. So we look back at the anchoring phenomena and think back to what the students came up with for ideas. It wasn't just to pursue the question, is it real or fake? We had a second question. And we can't always pursue two questions at the same time. This is why we have to keep track of our questions, because while we're pursuing one, maybe that'll raise a new question, but then we had some old questions we have to follow up on as well. And one of those was, right, the idea of, is something going to happen to the wet corn? And we should totally leave that wet corn in water in order to find out whether our predictions and our, our questions, what the answer to those are. That's how we're going to investigate this series of questions that we had from the driving question board related to what's our next step with the wet corn. After 10 days, a new phenomena emerges, and we start to notice new things that are going to raise more questions and the potential for more investigations to pursue. 
And that's what the teacher does. Let's work with these students' ideas about the things they're noticing and the new questions that come up as we start to see this corn sprout little white things. What are those? And these green things? Oh, my gosh. Tons of questions we have now. Tons of ideas for other investigations we want to pursue. And we would argue that this is how we start working with students' ideas related to investigations that they've done and investigations they want to do both around questions. Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to flip back to this to these photos for a minute of, of what this corn looks like. This is totally weird. I hope everybody can can uh, take a second and take a look at some of the th things that you can see here and the kids really key in on. We've got green stuff coming out. We've got other things growing out that are sort of whitish or brownish. It's, it's like totally weird. So we have a lot of questions here. Um, we think we've made some progress because we're pretty sure that this corn is not fake. Plastic doesn't do this, right? Like the stuff you buy at Target, it doesn't grow like this. This, this must be real corn, but it's like really weird because it's got all these different colors and it's just totally weird. So what we're seeing here is, um, uh, and some of you in the in the chat window noticed uh, something about the teacher's response to the kids' questions. Um, every lesson that we take, uh, we have to be making these connections. Like, wait, how did we get here? You all said if it was real, it would have something to hold the kernels. If it was real, it, uh, it would have maybe the strings that real corn does. I mean, remember you said if it was fake, it would just be like empty inside. So we're always trying to link back. Wait, how did we get here? Why are we doing this? And then when we notice something like, oh, okay, cool, the kids uh, are noticing stuff is coming out of the corn. So what should we do next? Oh, maybe we should uh, we should figure out like why the green things are growing in one way and the brown things are growing in another, etc. So if we walked over to a table of kids, imagine the, the scenario we were bringing up earlier, and we said, so what are you guys doing? Why are you working on this? Why are you taking the corn apart? Or why are you leaving it in water? They're not going to say, because the lesson says at the top of the page, today we're going to put some corn in water and see what happens. They're going to say, well, we were kind of not sure if it was alive or not alive. We took it apart, and we think it is something living, but we're still not sure whether it's going to happen when we leave it in water. So that's what we're going to check out. So, and what we want to um, bring up at this point is, is something in response to questions that came up in the chat window. Are we just going to follow the kids wherever they go? Um, what happens if the questions they come up with are not the ones we want them to come up with? What happens if they ask questions that are going to take us off track? So what we want to stress here is it's not just following the kids wherever they go. This is co-construction. It's teachers and kids working together. By carefully stacking the deck, we know some of the things that are going to come out from the kids. We've done this enough to know that the issue of is it real or is it fake, it's, it's pretty much always going to come out. And if it doesn't, kids will be saying things that are close enough with a little nudging from the teacher. We'll be able to push them and bring out this question. Um, wait, is it really going to grow? It, you know, you were just saying, like, when you banged it on the table there, it, it, it was like, like plastic. It was like really hard. Is that what real plants are like? So we can, we can pretty much always get, is it real or is it fake? Will it grow or will it just rot? Will the colors come out or are the kind of things that pretty much always come out? Now, will they ask other things that may not be super productive? Sure. I mean, in the storylines that we've worked on, um, the, we've tried to analyze the number of questions kids come up with and how many we actually get to in, the, in terms of what was planned in the unit. And it could be anywhere from 60 to 80 or even 90 percent of the questions we'll get to. Uh, we don't get to all the questions, but like, that's life. Or as someone said in the chat window, that's, that's science, right? So let's, let's move on to the, to the next part. How did we make progress? We made progress by engaging in practices. We said, oh, okay, if it's real, then we should see these things. If it's fake, we should see these things. So let's take it apart. Let's do that. Um, and the practices help us not just do the lesson, but figure something out. 
that is what we uh, came into the lesson with. Make progress on a question. And at the end of the lesson, maybe we figured out a piece of an idea, a cross-cutting concept or a disciplinary idea. Um, but often what we've done is figure out where we need to go next because we've decided where we're not sure. And that's what I would really want to push on in the next example. So, uh, but before we do that, um, let's pause for, uh, given where we are in time, let's just pause for, for one question about um, the ground that we've covered so far. All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, Jill had a question from earlier in the chat, and I think it's probably a concern of many teachers. How do teachers manage multiple classes of the same course that might take different paths? Well, again, so what we need to, that's a great question. And, and again, it kind of comes up um, to the question of figuring out which are the major milestones that we need to get to and which ones are we willing to uh, go different directions with. Um, in, in this classroom, uh, or in this storyline rather, the is it real and is it fake is something that we really need to push on, and so we do. And you'll find out in the next step uh, something else that turns out to be really key in making progress. Um, but uh, if kids uh, want to pursue some other investigations along the way, we have, then maybe we'll figure out how to do that. But it's kind of like establishing the milestones of the key things that we know we need to get to. Let's make sure we get to those and allowing some variation along the way. All right. Um, Denise also had a question, and I think you can touch on it pretty quickly. Okay. And that is, at what point do you end the topic? Well, that's a tricky question. Um, in a way, the topic is evolving as we go. I mean, um, so, I mean, I take the point of the question to be like, we could let kids be questioning forever. Um, and so we kind of have to figure out how to reach some consensus on at least one possible thing we can try next, because we could just be questioning forever or we could be trying to figure out ways we can make progress forever. But let's, let's just try something, and then let's see where we are. One of the things that, that a lot of the teachers we work with do is to make the kids' questions public. For older kids, there might be a driving question board, a board that keeps track of all the kids' questions. Or you saw in the corn example, the teacher is scribing the questions and keeping track of them. Um, and so even if we don't get to your question tomorrow, it's still up there. It's up there in the classroom, and we are going to get back to it. Um, so I don't, I don't know. There's no magic recipe for like exactly how many minutes or how many, how many days it's going to take. But um, we need to, we need to make progress. And so in, in the classroom you just saw, they brainstormed questions, and then when they came back tomorrow, they said, okay, so what are we going to do? We got lots of questions. I'm sure we'll come up with more. But let's, let's see if we can make some progress. Brian, can I piggyback on that? Sorry, Michael, did you want to say something? Uh, yes, can I take you back on that? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, part of, I think, the trick there in honoring students' questions is also to be keeping in mind how are we stacking the deck of the questions and phenomena that we start with and that we investigate along the way such that we're also helping get to the performance expectations we're targeting, right? So we're trying to keep both both in, in, in our line of vision, because when we've achieved the performance expectations that the storyline targets and we've honored most students' questions, that's a great point at which to be taking stock as a class and be like, are we feeling good about our work? Do we feel like we figured some stuff out? And as a teacher, also feeling like, and I feel like I've helped build kids' understanding towards the, the learning goals that we're working towards. So um, let's move on with, the, with the, the case, and we'll just see a little bit more that I think will also help um, make more concrete how the, uh, the story evolves and then class makes progress. So um, uh, I want to call your attention to the, um, uh, the um, 
comment here, which was something the teacher tweeted out as she was sort of tracking the progress of the class here. Um, some of the kids, as we were noticing the stuff coming out of the corn, were convinced that the, these sprouts are coming out of the kernels. But some thought that the sprouts are coming from the cob. They're coming from underneath the kernels. And some weren't sure. So here is a typical example of something that either spontaneously comes out from the kids or can easily be um, brought out just by asking kids, so where do you think these things are coming from? Uh, and it raises some questions about, so which part of the corn is actually growing? And so we have a video here that just gives you a little flavor of the kids' conversation about this. After some open discussion, the, the teacher has pulled them into a scientist circle and ask them to um, uh, make make their claims about what they think is going on. So we'll we'll let you take a quick look at this video, so you can hear some of the kids' conversation. All right, thank you, Brian. I've gone ahead and put the chat or put the link in. I'm putting it in again. This is a 45 second video, so we'll see you in 45 seconds. All right, if everyone could come back. Brian, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. Um, so if you had a chance to look uh, at, at the video, that's great. If not, I'll try and pull out some of the key moments. We heard from three students. Um, and, and what I'd like to point out about what we heard is not only did we hear their interpretation, we also heard a little bit of their, uh, of their evidence. So the first student says, uh, it's coming from the cob. I see it coming from underneath the kernel, so it must be from the cop. Then another student, and it's kind of nice, these second graders are very practiced and disagreeing with each other. They know that that's a way to make progress in the science classroom. The second student says, I disagree with you because when I look closely, I saw a sprout coming from out of a kernel, and she points uh, to where she sees that. And then the third student, sort of the peacemaker, says, okay, you could be, both be right. Um, I see some are coming from the kernels and some are coming from the cob. So we have a disagreement. What should we do? Um, well, the teacher uh, works with the kids to figure out what to do next. And um, they decide that they need to do an investigation. Um, so they make something. A lot of classrooms do a notice and wondering chart in second grade. And this classroom uh, does a notice, wonder, investigate, and predict chart. Um, since we're not sure if it's coming from the kernels or the cob, what should we do next? Um, let's set up an investigation to see if the sprouts are coming from the cob or the kernels. And as you may remember, this picks up on an idea that one of the students had way back um, earlier in the conversation and said, hey, we could, we could plant and see whether a particular piece is a seed or not, right? So they decide to fill pots with some soil and put the cob, a piece of the cob into the container put the kernel into a different container, add water, and then see what happens. So here's an experiment again. If you walked over to the kids and said, why are you guys doing this? Why are you planting a piece of the cob and a piece of the kernel uh, and some kernels? They would say, well, because we were disagreeing about which part of it is actually growing. They have a reason to do the experiment. And here, fast forwarding to the results, uh, which take a while to grow. Um, if we had more time, I would ask you all to make a prediction. But what happened is um, the cob did not sprout. The cob did not grow. Uh, instead, um, the kernels grew, but not the cob. And here's the teacher's summary. Um, and as, we, as normally happens, we made some progress, but hey, we got more questions. The cob didn't sprout, but the kernels did. The kids are thinking, are the kernels seeds? But now we're wondering, hey, what's inside the kernel to make it sprout? So um, we kind of think of this as a, as a 
as the teacher throwing the wrench into the progress in a very productive way. And sometimes we call this uh, problematizing. Um, we've got some questions. We make a partial model. We think that the thing is alive and it's growing. But wait, where is it growing from? Is it the cob or the kernel? Hey, we're scientists. Let's test it. Um, and that leads to an investigation. Not because the teacher said, okay, today's lesson is we're going to figure out whether it's the seed, whether the kernel is uh, where the thing is growing from or the cob, but because the kids had a disagreement or a gap in their model, and we need to do an investigation to figure out what's going on and make progress. And notice again that um, we, we came out with a question. Uh, now we think that it's the kernels that are really growing. We think that the kernels are actually seeds. But wait, so what's inside a seed that makes a, a plant grow? Remember that experiment that we were talking about before that didn't necessarily, at least the way we framed it, didn't have a reason to, to do that experiment? Hey, now we've got a reason. We have a phenomenon. We have stuff growing out of a tiny little kernel. A tall green shoot grows out of this tiny kernel. How is this possible? What's inside of it? Now we've got a question. Now we want to know. So now we have a reason to do that experiment. And as the stuff continues to grow in this classroom, we end up with lots of different questions. And so some of these are listed here. Um, we know it needs water, but does too much water affect the plants? And wait, um, the kids notice, you know what? These plants seem to be growing towards the sun. So does our corn need light? We're going to set up an investigation to find out if actually plants need light. And so that leads to another investigation. Does sunlight help the corn grow? I wonder how we could test this. Well, the kids come up with, we'll put some of the corn in the dark and some of it in the light and see what happens. Hey, now we have a reason to do that experiment that we brought up like way back when in a sort of unmotivated way. Right Now we have a reason, we have a phenomenon. Some of the plants are bending toward the light. We have an idea, but to really test it, let's do an experiment. So um, uh, I think I'm going to suggest we um, take a look now really quickly at this last video just to sort of see how the progress the kids make. Um, this one's a little longer. Um, and uh, take a look at the video and then We'll resume in a minute and 25 seconds. The link is in the chat window. So um, uh, our time is, is drawing to a close, so I want to try and um, pull us back together. I know that it's hard to pull yourself away from the video of these kids. They're so uh, wonderful in the way they do science. Uh, if you didn't get the video to work or have enough time to see it, what you saw 
what you would have seen is the kids, um, they're kind of looking at the results um, at an intermediate point. Um, the plant on the, on the left of the screen is the one they, most of the kids think is going to die. Uh, that was the one in the dark. Um, and uh, the students pointing out some of the leaves are, are, are getting brown. Um, it's a little confusing because it's actually grown taller than the one that was in the light. But the one in the light looks really healthy and green. Um, and uh, bringing in um, connections from everyday life, as somebody pointed out in the chat window, is a, a part of what we do when we interpret our findings. You know, I know a lot of plants are green, and when they get yellow, like when grass gets yellow, or when it starts to turn brown, they're going to die. Um, and so the kids are pretty convinced here. They want to see uh, it continue to happen, but this is the clip that we have from the sort of intermediate result that, yeah, I think light is really important uh, for plants to grow. So um, the, the, there are uh, a lot of questions that emerge about different aspects of what makes plants what is happening to these uh, to these uh, corn uh, corn kernels as they're growing, and what's happening to the plant, and what's inside the kernel, and when we put all of those pieces together, that's how we're getting our uh, model for what it is that plants need to grow. What are, what are the structures that um, uh, plants have that allow them to work with the light and get the water, and uh, those brown things that seem to be growing toward the water and the green things that seem to be growing up toward the light and all of those pieces we need to put together um, in order to build finally our model. So um, in a way, the topic started off being like what will happen to the corn in the water, but then the topic evolved into what's happening to the corn, how is it growing, and the questions evolved as we went through the unit and eventually getting us to um, uh, some of the key performance expectation uh, that this unit addresses in terms of what do plants need uh, in order to grow. So I, I'm going to turn things over to Michael to wrap it up. Great. So I saw some in our chat window some people asking about, well, how, how long do we pursue students' questions and which questions do we pursue and what target PEs do how do we know when we're done? What target P's are we working towards? Uh, and though I pasted some of those in the window, we have some overview documents that can answer some of those questions. Uh, really what we want to emphasize in these overview documents we're going to show you in the next couple of slides is we want to give you examples of what it looks like when you put these routines together because that's what we say makes for a coherent storyline, which is a flow of questions that are motivated by investigating phenomena figuring some things out, which then always leads to raising new questions. And the order of these questions we found is, with, as Brian said, with some nudging from the teacher, which is some stacking of the deck of the phenomena we've looked at in a certain order, seems to always lead classes of students to raise the same questions. And we've just investigated the start of this storyline around the first few lessons, but there are more lessons. And to look at an overview of what those other lessons are, uh, you can look at a, the full skeleton for the storyline, which is three pages long, uh, when we're done with the webinar, and that's in the NSTA webinar collection, which shows there are more than just these lessons. Um, and then for who, those of you who are interested, uh, we'll provide a URL to help you access these open source uh, educational resources you can use for any purpose. Uh, this is in your classrooms or professional development uh, on a website to get the teacher guides and student activity guides and more detailed supports if you're interested in this particular example. Um, I think we have a little, a little short on time here, so I'm going to kind of make a, a brief point. This idea of focusing on coherence isn't something that we're just uh, dwelling on because we think it's important for kids. It is part of what needs to be addressed in terms of what the equip rubric calls for uh, in, for supporting three-dimensional learning. And there are two elements in the equip rubric uh, in their criteria, 1A and 1D, uh, that address this question. That the need for the explanatory ideas is coming out of students' questions about phenomena. And that each step in a coherent storyline is addressing the questions that have been raised or gaps in the explanations they've developed so far. 
Uh, and that really summarizes for us what we're trying to get at with coherence and how these routines can work together to support that. So, Brian, I think we might have time for this. Should we do one more poll here? Sure. If we can do it quickly. Go for it. All right. So we've got these we've got these issues, these five issues, which in your mind now is sort of you seeing the most challenging to address in your own classroom with your own students or your own grade. Uh, we have the five options to, to pick from, and so we're going to turn it over um, to you all to take uh, to take a quick vote. Well, thank you, Michael. So, uh, which of these issues do you see as the most challenging to address in your own classroom? Is it how we kick off the investigations as a unit? How we work with students to motivate the next step as an investigation? How do we help students use practices to figure out the pieces of the science ideas? Or D, how do we push students to go deeper and revise the science ideas we have built together so far? Or E, how do we help students put together pieces of the disciplinary core ideas and the cross-cutting concepts? Uh, we have about 250 people here, so please vote. Um, I'll give you a, about uh, 15 more seconds to vote, and then I'm going to lock the responses and publish them so we can go on to our next poll. All right. Uh, Ten more seconds. And I'm going to lock the responses and publish those and try to find a spot on this slide. Uh, let me try to put them right here, and I'll turn it back over to you. Cool. So everything's hard. Um, but in particular, we had more votes for, for D and E. Um, pushing students to go deeper and helping students put pieces together. And I think um, we would agree with that uh, in terms of the kind of comments we hear from teachers. I mean, one of the things, and, you know, uh, this may even be more true of uh, older kids than younger kids, every lesson is like a whole other thing, right? And one of the problems that we know we have is pieces don't fit together for kids. Um, and so, the uh, working with students to figure out where we need to go next and helping them connect what we just figured out to where we've been, um, putting the pieces together and having them see that, wait, you know, we did make some progress, but we still need to go deeper, um, is something that uh, it's, it's not just a matter of having things set up right in the lesson plans. It, it's a, it, it really requires some skillful teaching. So um, I think we have time for uh, some final Q&A before we close and move off into um, asking you to do the evaluation. So uh, let's take some questions. All right. Thank you, Brian. Um, I do have, if you have questions, you can go ahead and type them into the chat. But I do have some questions that I wrote down from earlier in the chat. And one is from Kathleen and then followed directly by another one from Julie. And the question from Kathleen is, how is the learning assessed? And then I'm going to follow up with a secondary question and then report it on a report card to parents. I think that is a question that a lot of teachers have. So I'll turn that over to you. Michael, do you want to take that one? So it's a standard based grading question. That, that's hard, right? Because uh, it requires getting the administration and the building to support communicating the type of things we need to communicate to parents um, that represent what we're really looking for in three-dimensional learning, which is not represented well by a letter grade, right? Um, our experience in our own school has been to try to build um, things like the um, evidence statements that help, keep, uh, help parents see the kind of work that we're doing in the classroom and, and have kids take those home. Uh, as a point of discussion to talk to parents about and identify areas they want to work on and things they want to keep exploring further or with things that they feel satisfactory. Uh, they've developed satisfactory models and answers to. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it's hard to do with a traditional report card. 
And in terms of assessment, um, one of the things that the kids do, it, it, at least for the, the coin example we talked about, is the point is not just to say, okay, plant, what do plants need? Okay, and then let me list for you. Plants need light, plants need water, etc. The kids' investigation journals that they make document the question. We didn't get to this part of the storyline, but as the class realizes, hey, there's too many questions for us all to work on the same question, they end up dividing up questions, and each group works on their own question. Um, and But in order to investigate the question, the kids need to make something that essentially is comparable to what you saw as the notice and wonder and then investigate and predict chart. They have to say, here's the question we came up with. Here's the thing that led to this question. Um, here's how we think we can investigate it, and here's what our prediction is. And so that becomes part of their investigation journal that then concludes with the resources that um, – or concludes with what their findings were from the investigation that they did. And so their story about here's what we figured out from our investigation is the thing that they're assessed on. That was one of the things in that classroom. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, Carolina had a question. How do you ensure a few students don't monopolize the process? Yeah, this is a really important issue, and I noticed also some teachers asking questions about, you know, how do you make this work when you have large class sizes and so on. Um, there are a number of great resources out there that we would um, point you to. I mean, I think a couple of people in the chat window talked about um, the talk science resources or the talk moves and also the resources from Mark Winschittle at University of Washington. Um, and so there, there, this is definitely something that that we need to work on as teachers with our kids. It may just be, you know, we have one or two kids that are like the ones that are trying to get in there with their questions or get in with there with their ideas about investigations, but you have to use moves that say, well, who else can build on that idea or can someone else, who, who agrees with it, who doesn't agree with it, or who has a question for this student who just said we should do this particular investigation. And it, it can't just be two or three kids or a subset, small subset of kids coming up with the questions or coming up with the ideas for investigations. And there are strategies that we need to use to, to make sure that it's the class's questions and not just, you know, one kid's question. Brian, could you give an example of maybe some strategies you might use? Um, sure. Well, um, one is actually who can put that. So th again, these are some of the talk moves that that are very popular. Um, who can put um, Michael's idea in their own words? Or um, how many people agree with Michael? How many people don't agree with Michael? OK, if you don't agree. Um, or if you're not sure, you know, what's a question you might have for Michael to help, help you understand his idea for investigation? And can somebody, you know, another strategy is can somebody build on that? You know, Michael had the idea of planting the, the seed. What else could we do? Can someone, you know, think of another a version of that idea? Yeah, I agree, Brian. And, and I, in the reframing of the question, back to the kids again, be like, why are we doing this? Wait, what question is this going to help us answer? Help us? Can someone help us keep track of this? Can someone help us put all this together? Uh, just helps share the, the intellectual uh, lifting lifting of intellectual weight across everyone in the class. Outstanding. Thank you so much for that clarification. Uh, Ryan had a question, and he kind of starts out with a little explanation. So I'm going to read you his whole comment. I foresee it difficult to plan out an NGSS year pacing guide if using various storylines could go in various directions. Any advice? Well, the surprising thing to hear is that the design teams that build the storylines largely anticipate about three quarters or more of the direction the storyline is going to go ahead of time. Uh, and some of the process that supports that, and there are some design tools uh, on our site that support that process, but um, one big part of that is is getting into unpacking the framework and, and really trying to dig into 
what students' perspectives on different phenomena and what their explanations would be um, before ever teaching it with kids. Yeah, and again, I would go back to the idea that that um, the teacher needs to know what are the key parts, what are the key issues that I need to make sure come out. And, you know, at some point, the kids might be really happy to keep on brainstorming or keep on asking questions or keep on coming up with ideas about other things we can investigate. But, um, you know, it needs to be a balance between um, divergence and convergence. And there, there's a point at which the teacher will just need to say, okay, cool, we got a lot of ideas. We got too much work already we outlined for ourselves to do. Um, let's see if we can make some progress, right? And let's, let's keep going. So it's kind of like picking your battles, you know. Let's decide the, the four important things. In a, the teacher needs to know the four important things that are key to getting this unit done. And Brian, you would say that teachers almost need to decide that ahead of time so they can direct the student conversation that way, but still allow them to brainstorm. Am I correct? Yeah, I mean, if you, these storylines existed before the class, uh, class had the conversations, right? So we knew that we were going to get to planning the cob versus planning the kernel. We didn't know exactly what conversation was going to lead to that, but there were a number of key things. Now, there are also things that come out that we didn't anticipate that are totally fine and, and we can go with, but you got to make that decision on the fly about whether this is something I can go with or whether it's a great idea, but, you know, I'm going to have to sort of keep it in the back pocket until we can move it in later. Excellent. Thank you very much. If you have other questions for the presenters, um, please type them into the chat. And it looks like, gentlemen, there are a couple people still typing some questions. Uh, someone wanted to know if you're both on Twitter. Yes, we're both on Twitter, and our slides, the, the first interest slide has our Twitter handles. Okay, wonderful. And also, Julie wants to know, how do you address absent student learning? Because absences are, can be a very big problem. Yeah, I agree. Um, I have a couple of thoughts, but um, part of it is the class taking responsibility that we are all making progress on this together. And so if a student is absent, one of the things that, w that we see teachers doing is, this, is another student has to sort of try and catch them up. Can you show them your journal from yesterday and talk through, like, what were we doing and why were we doing it and then where did we end up? And that sort of common theme of like, wait, what are we working on? What are we trying to figure out? Every day should have a question. Maybe it's the same question we had yesterday. We're still trying to make progress on it. But somebody else should be um, able to fill those gaps and not just, you know, have the teacher do it. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think those are all the questions that we have at this time. Well, we invite you all to check out the Storyline site and, uh, you know, uh, pepper us with questions. And we're always looking for people to try out. These are all freely downloadable uh, resources. All right. Thank you very much, Brian. So I would really like to thank today's presenters, Brian Reiser from Northwestern University and Michael Novak from Parkview School and Northwestern University for an outstanding and informative web seminar. I'd also like to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York for sponsoring today's program. And finally, I'd like to thank the administration of NSTA for their support of web seminars.